Well, good morning, and can I welcome everyone to this, the 27th meeting of the Public Audit Committee in uh, 2024. Um, the uh, committee is uh, made up of uh, James Dornan, who joins us online this morning. Uh, morning, James. Uh, and Graeme Simpson uh, has to uh, present amendments to another committee, but may be joining us later on in the session, depending on how that, uh, how that goes. Um, Agenda item one uh, for the committee is to agree or not to take agenda items four and five in private this morning. Are we agreed? agreed. We are agreed. Thank you. Agenda item two is to decide whether or not to take our meeting next Thursday, the 14th of November, in private. Are we all agreed on that? Agreed. We are agreed. Thank you. <clears throat> and agenda item three is uh, consideration of the 2023-24 audit of the Scottish Government's uh, consolidated accounts and I'm very pleased to welcome uh, in the committee room this morning uh, the Auditor General for Scotland Stephen Boyle uh, and the Auditor General is joined this morning by Carol Grant who is an audit director and by Helen Russell who is a senior audit manager uh, both also at Audit Scotland. Uh, we've got uh, quite a number of questions to put to you this morning Auditor General uh, but before we get to those can I invite you to make a short opening statement? Many thanks, Convener. Good morning, Committee. I am presenting this report on the 2023-24 audit of the Scottish Government's consolidated accounts under Section 22 of the Public Finance and Accountability Scotland Act 2000. The Scottish Government's annual consolidated accounts are a critical component of its accountability to Parliament and the public. My independent opinion on the consolidated accounts is unqualified. That means that I am confident that they provide a true and fair view of the Government's finances and that they meet legal and accounting requirements. Can I highlight the following areas from my report? The first is on financial performance. The Scottish Government responded to emerging financial pressures during 2023-24 to ensure that spending remained in line with the budget approved by Parliament. Net spending for the year was £54 billion. £277 million less than budget, which equates to an underspend of around 0.5%. This was achieved by applying measures that gave short-term relief during the financial year, but don't thereafter address the underlying financial challenges that the Government is facing. In respect of financial sustainability, the Scottish Government continues to face significant demands on its finances. Finding a path to balance in the current financial year 24-25 has also been challenging and has again required the application of spending controls and non-recurring measures such as the potential use of Scotland revenues. There has not yet been enough progress with the connected factor of moving the reform and redesign of public services to make them more affordable. Later this month I will publish a report on the Scottish Government's approach to fiscal sustainability and public service reform. I have highlighted that the current due diligence process for the increased costs to complete MV Glen Rosa need to be concluded to support value for money assessments. The report also covers the progress that the Government has made with the implementation of the Oracle cloud system which went live last month. This process completed following a series of earlier delays. The new system, though, should provide better data to support decision-making and deliver efficiencies. The current estimation of implementation costs, though, is significantly higher than the initial assessment due to increased timescales and initial underestimation of the scale and complexity of the programme. Lastly, convener, the report also notes that it's vital that the review of the National Performance Framework results in agreed national outcomes that are supported by measurable indicators so that the Scottish Government and users of their financial information and services can be better satisfied that progress is being clearly demonstrated. Convener, as ever, Carol, Helen and myself look forward to answering the committee's questions. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much indeed. And uh, can I begin the questions by uh, turning to one of the points that you raised in your opening? And that is about the uh, level of underspends. I mean, do you consider the level of underspends reported in the consolidated accounts to be reasonable? I think um, I guess the first couple of points to make on that, Convener, is that the Scottish Government has to break even. 
in terms of its so it is managing um, a budget in excess of fifty billion pounds, and that is it has to fall on one side of the line. As the committee will be familiar, the Scottish government um, through the fiscal framework has to work within those powers. So it, it, whilst it is able to borrow for both revenue and capital purposes, there are constraints and there are limits uh, on its borrowing. The, 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 the ratio of underspend, so just to give some of the detail, just to support our assessment, is that uh, resource or revenue underspend in the year um, was £193 million, pounds, which is 0.4% of the budget. Capital underspend of £84 million, pounds, or 3.4%. Underspends do fluctuate from one year to the next. The committee, we recall, that the underspend during some of the COVID years uh, was higher, and then it has changed. So I think that is a reasonable underspend, um, given the, um, the scale of the budget uh, overall. And the important point, of course, alongside that, is that the money's not lost to the Scottish budget. It is uh, transferred into the Scotland Reserve for use in future years. OK, but one of the capital underspends is in uh, transport, net zero and just transition. And I think there the, underspend, the capital underspend there is £60 million, which is, I think, equivalent to 10% of the capital budget for that department. I mean, we, don't you think that is... Um, or, or do you know the reasons why there is such a significant underspend in particular departments of government? Yes, we do. Um, the, the underspends over a, a certain threshold, and I'll bring um, colleagues in just to say a, a bit more detail about the, uh, the spending. Of, uh, turn to Helen in a moment, just to set out some of the, the differences by department. The Scottish Government's Consolidated Accounts will set out larger underspends and, or, or overspends for that matter and, and provide a bit of detail that in the various departmental analysis um, within the accounts covering uh, revenue and capital. And on the specific point you mentioned about some of those capital underspends, um, there will be factors convener, and I think particularly in capital, and, and the committee have heard much in, in recent years about some of the, the more challenging environment that capital projects are facing uh, by way of you know, build cost inflation, and that will be partly behind that. But I do agree, I think in principle it is a reasonable area of scrutiny that the committee may wish to explore further as to why certain capital projects, whether and principally about road, uh, road building, I think was uh, the nature of some of the underspend. But if you're content, I'll maybe pause and pass to Helen and just say a bit more detail about the various underspends. Thank you, Auditor General. Good morning. Um, so in terms of the underspend, yes, uh, that, 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 as you can see from Exhibit 3, um, that the, there, there was a, a, a giving up, if you like, of, of funding of £300 million in total. Um, it related to, in part, small vessel replacement programmes, um, and it was port works that were reprofiled. It's important to note that much of the underspend has basically been reprofiled, so it's been put off. Um, it's not that it's being stopped, it's just being, it's just being paused. And because it's capital, it also takes a while to get contracts up and running. So if you don't start these processes early enough, they end up taking longer then to put into place. Um, and transport were able to actually advise that, that certain contracts had not yet been put into place, so they, 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 they could put up those as savings. But a reprofiling to me sounds like a delay, and I think I think we understand that there has been inflation in construction, for example, for a number of years. Um, but I'm not quite sure that um, gives us a plausible reason why spending on infrastructure like ports or the small vessels program has been delayed, uh, especially given the pressures we know, especially uh, in the ferry fleet. And I think that's a reasonable challenge, convener. That there, whilst you know. In the round, there will be environmental factors, uh, whether it's you know, build cost inflation, availability of labour to support the delivery of, of some of these projects. There is also alongside that some more local factors about you know, management of projects, availability, you know, appetite of tenderers to, to submit for projects that will, will be part of this. Um, so I, th I think in our, in our audit, it's not designed to um, give complete assurance about the, the management of individual projects for uh, across the, the capital programme. But, but from, a, from an audit perspective, is, is, is that reported uh, correctly? 
is the analysis and description that the government sets out in their accounts is that reasonably representative of the circumstances? And I think our view that it is, and as you'll know, we, we maintain a keen interest in the, the overall management of the, the capital programme. And I think, as I mentioned, um, Carol and I will you know, be speaking further about the overall fiscal sustainability that's connected to that point. Yeah, and I think the Scottish Government's consolidated accounts uh, are a key component of the Scottish Government's accountability to Parliament and to the people. So um, it may well be that the committee uh, will consider inviting the Scottish Government's uh, Chief Accountable Officer to give evidence at some point in the future on the consolidated accounts. Uh, can I move us on to uh, another area which, again, you highlighted uh, in the report, and that is um, around uh, Social Security Scotland. Um, I guess one of the questions uh, that uh, for us as a public audit committee uh, is a matter of interest uh, are um, what levels of action is Social Security Scotland taking uh, to assess uh, both fraud and error in the system? Yeah, thank you, Kevin. I'll, I'll bring Carol in uh, shortly who can say a bit more about, I guess, a couple of relevant factors. One is the, the overall interpretation that Carol makes as the group auditor of the Scottish Government's consolidated accounts that relates to fraud and error in the system that has been identified in other accounts, in this case Social Security Scotland, and what the auditor's judgment. Just as a, as a bit of background, the, the auditor of Social Security Scotland has qualified their regularity opinion um, on Social Security Scotland, and that means that they weren't satisfied that the totality of spending in the budget was was in, sorry, in their accounts was consistent with the approved budget because of fraud and error in the system. And the fraud and error related to uh, amounts that are reflected in Social Security Scotland accounts and indeed the Scottish Government's accounts by consolidation uh, of benefits administered by the DWP. So uh, Carol can speak more convenient about it. So whilst we are seeing some elements of progress, the reason for the regularity qualification is any fraud or error by its nature is inconsistent with the approved budget. And therefore, the auditor's view was that that wasn't regular, wasn't legal, um, and progress needs to be taken or made to address the level of fraud and error. Um, can, I'll pass to Carol, I can just um, take the committee through that in a bit more detail. Thank you, Auditor General. <clears throat> yeah, so. The Auditor General has, has captured the, the situation in terms of the error and fraud within the DWP administered benefits, and that flows through into the, the regularity opinion. There are long standing um, processes for those estimates within those benefit streams. What Social Security Scotland is doing now is developing their own understanding for the benefit streams that they are administering. Um, I think last year in the session I'd mentioned that there was a, a pilot exercise for the Scottish Child Payment that was getting undertaken to look at the levels of what's known as official error um, within those benefit streams. That is the error that's introduced by um, the, the administration of them. Um, this year, um, that has been used to inform a, an analysis of Best Start Foods, um, the, the benefit stream within Best Start Foods. That will be published, I believe, in the next week or so um, in terms of the, the outcome of that. What I think is important to note, though, is that at the moment, Social Security Scotland can only um, look at official error. They actually don't have the, the legislation in place to enable them to look at claimant error or fraud that may <coughs> occur. That's critical to understand um, the benefit streams that they're administering. The Auditor of Social Security Scotland um, has stated within their annual audit report, which will be available on our website um, after the accounts are laid, which I think, again, will be in the next week or so, um, they have stated that significant work is still required to measure the fraud and error that exists within the full range of benefits. Um, and they've made a recommendation which has been accepted by Social Security Scotland. So, you know, I would say there has, there has been work in that area and they are looking to build it slowly, kind of learn and develop their arrangements. But there's still quite a lot to be done um, to get to the level of a, an accurate assessment of both the official error and the claimant error that exists within the, the benefit streams administered. Can, I mean, sorry to push you on this, but can I just understand this a little bit more? I mean, at the moment, uh, as I understand it, uh, almost two thirds, 63 per cent of Social Security Scotland benefits are administered by the Department of Work and Pensions. Mm -hmm. um, so are you saying, Carol, that there isn't uh, the, the Scottish the Social Security Scotland 
doesn't have proper oversight of fraud and error in that system. And then my second question related to that is, mm. again, it's, it's um, uh, projected that those uh, benefits will be administered by the end of 25-26 by Social Security Scotland themselves. But you're saying there's a legislative gap, which means they can't currently <coughs> scrutinise uh, error and fraud? So, yes. So, at the moment, they, they are not able to access the, the claimant side information in a way to enable them to understand if there is any error or fraud that exists within what was submitted. What they can look at as, is how it was processed um, and any error within that. And they, both, they look at both underpayments and overpayments because both are important in terms of a benefit system. Um, the DWP administered benefits have long standing arrangements in place um, and, and they are well understood. Um, as you know, there's also legislative differences between the, the arrangements in place in terms of what it means from an accounting point of view, in terms of the regularity opinion. So that is why you will be seeing that reduce over time, um, partly due to case transfer, as you have mentioned, as more benefits come to be administered um, by Social Security Scotland. But it is an area that, that needs real focus, I would say, in relation to ensuring that there are sufficient arrangements in place to give a robust estimate of the error and fraud that exists within those benefit streams. Thank you. I mean, as I mentioned earlier on, we may well uh, invite um, the Scottish Government to give evidence to us on the consolidated accounts, and that sounds like an area that we would be keen to get a bit more detail from them about and what their plans are. Um, uh, I want to move on to uh, a couple of other areas. Uh, one is um, expenses associated with litigation. So the committee in previous years has, been, has taken an interest uh, in the uh, uh, payments that have had to be uh, made uh, to former directors of Rangers Football Club. And I think um, we've seen uh, £60 million worth of unplanned spend, as it's called, uh, paid out from the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. Uh, which um, uh, has uh, left a large hole in the accounts uh, uh, because of uh, those uh, uh, settlements that have been made. Uh, uh, this year, um, I think the payment that you've um, um, highlighted is much uh, considerably less than that. I think it's £0.34 million pounds, uh, paid out uh, this year uh, with the provision for a further £7 million. Pounds. I mean, where are we um, in the trajectory of those cases and those settlements? Have they now all been settled, almost all been settled? Do you expect any further claims to be made? So I think there's, there's probably some of that we can answer, Convener, but maybe not uh, all of it this morning. Um, you, you're right, we, we focused... Um, a number of times in recent years of the, the unplanned nature of that uh, expenditure and the, the provisions included in the figure of £60 million is, is one that we've reported on previously. I think where we've um, stopped short of going uh, terribly further beyond that was in recognition of uh, ongoing legal and processes and inquiries into some of the circumstances um, around that. Um, I'll maybe just turn to colleagues if we have any further detail on you know, the current position uh, in terms of the figures that you mentioned and where that might go next. If we don't have that to hand today, Camilla, we can come back to you in writing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So just to confirm that we did um, speak to the auditor of, of, of the courts and um, there's been not much change, to be quite honest, in the figures. So the claims are now coming to an end. But they still had some costs still still to sort of sort out and pay in 24, 25. Um, and um, the next step will be, as we have said before, will be the kind of stages where 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 I'll, I'll, I'll look at what's gone 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 on will will be taking place. So, um, roughly speaking, how much has been spent on these cases so far? I don't have that total figure to hand. I'm sorry, but there has been minimal change since last year. Which was £60 million. Which was £60, pounds. yeah. Okay. I think that is, it, it remains of that order, convener of £60 million. Okay, pounds. okay thanks. I, I'm going to move on to a, a final area that I've got a question on, uh, and that is to do with the, um, the extent to which um, the consolidated accounts reflect all um, assets and liabilities in the public sector, which has been a long-standing 
bone of contention, I think, for you, Auditor General, and for the Public Audit Committee, I think, going back to 2016, when we were promised uh, greater transparency, uh, a much wider coverage of uh, the, um, uh, the assets and liabilities, uh, what's owned and what's owed uh, in the accounts. Now, um, we've received correspondence from the uh, Chief uh, Financial Officer um, of the Government, uh, who said to us, um, it has been discussed, the, the, it, there is not a further set of consolidated accounts, it has been discussed with Audit Scotland that the value that would be derived from a full set of accounts would not reflect the efforts required to deliver it. Is that your view? So a couple of things. I'll, I'll bring Caroline, actually, who has been uh, engaging with the Chief Finance Officer of the Scottish Government and her team on trying to get to a process, an output that is valuable and proportionate. Before doing that, Kevin, I think if, if you permit me, I think just to echo the judgment that we've made in today's report that there has been progress um, after a long period of time. You know, it goes back to you know, uh, 2016, 2017, when this was first mooted, about the need for more transparency for the Parliament to better understand uh, not just the consolidated accounts, because the accounting boundary of the consolidated accounts that the Committee has before it today excludes some really important um, parts of where public spending takes place in Scotland, the associated uh, assets and liabilities that go alongside that. So the the consolidated additional information uh, that the committee has received correspondence from the Chief Finance Officer, in our view, is a step forward. You know, so it, it begins to capture the Scottish administration. You can see a direction of travel that brings in you know, significant liabilities through the uh, NHS and teachers' pension funds that begins to disclose you know, the, um, the longer term or the medium term position of, of Scottish public spending. And then that final piece of bringing in, again, the assets, liabilities, revenues and expenditure of other parts of the Scottish public sector, so local authorities. There's a point, I think, and Carol might want to say more about this convener, is that um, not all accounts in the Scottish public sector are prepared in the same way. So uh, any committee or, or users of public financial information that looks at a set of local government accounts, for example, will see really quite different uh, accounting and disclosure arrangements than they might be familiar with in terms of either central government or NHS accounts. So marrying up quite different sets of accounting is, I think, the next step, removing inter-organisational uh, transactions that I think is recognised that hasn't been done uh, in, in these accounts. So there's work to do. I think what we, what we wanted to recognise in, in our judgement is that we are seeing progress. So it might not be the totality of a consolidated whole of government public sector accounts for Scotland, but I think what uh, you're seeing and what we've kind of reached that is a positive direction of travel. But again, Carol, who's been closely involved in this, can, can say more to the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Auditor General. Um, so going, going back a little bit in terms of the, the history of this, um, as you'll be aware, the plan was to use whole of government accounts process um, to prepare a consolidated set of public sector accounts for Scotland. Um, the impact of the pandemic in terms of the, the audit uh, landscape has, has been significant. As part of the approach to um, address that, the threshold by which the, the information in the whole of government <coughs> accounts is audited was increased quite significantly. Um, so it felt like there was, it was, the time was right to, um, I suppose, take a step back and think about what is the gap? Um, what could be produced from what is available? And putting that out for, for consultation to see whether that is enough, um, whether that fills the gap and the need that was there. Um, what the Auditor General has said in relation to the accounting, there would, there's a lot of complexity involved in trying to bring the accounting treatment together, which would have been resolved by whole of government accounts. Um, but that isn't in place um, for Scotland. And there's some 22, 23 um, sets of accounts that are still not signed off in Scotland, just to give an indication of the, the delays that are, that are existing within the system. What I am hopeful for in terms of this is almost irrespective of how the first version is created, the value will be in trend over time, I hope, because that is where you will be able to see, measured on a consistent basis, whether the 
assets are outstripping the liabilities, what is moving. Um, I think what's important is how that is analysed, the different types of asset and liability, and whether that gives enough information. I am something else that um, we've been thinking about is even at the moment it doesn't include narrative around about contingent liabilities, which are a potential liability. So maybe more detail in that space. But it really is about interested stakeholders engaging and saying what would be helpful um, and seeing what I suppose is, is possible in that space. Um, I do think that it is, as the Auditor General has said, a, a step forward um, and give something for people to now consider. Um, and see whether it addresses the gap, or if the gap still exists, what more needs to be done. Okay, but as I understand it, and based on that letter that corresponds we've received from the Chief Finance Officer, um, it seems to st stop short of uh, that total whole government account. I mean, is, that st is, is it your understanding that still remains uh, the government's uh, ambition, uh, or are they saying, no, it's not worthwhile us doing that for the effort that's required to be put into it, we wouldn't get the return? Is that, I mean, I'm not quite sure where so, we are with that. So, again, Carol can, can maybe give an additional insight into the government's thinking on that, but I'm not, I'm not seeing uh, unreasonable limits being set by government on this convener at this moment. I think that this is a genuine uh, first step and one that they are looking for feedback. So, they're looking to hear from you know, probably the committee and uh, the parliament more widely and also academics and users of public accounts uh, more generally just to, to hear where they might go next um, as, as Carol mentions that you know whilst the the initial ambition I, and quite reasonably in my view has been to prepare a whole of government accounts for Scotland I think some of the factors that uh, have interrupted that process have required a degree of pragmatism as to you know, what we can achieve um, but without um, letting s some of the day-to-day -day factors that are here with us derail the process. Um, I, it's taken a long time, convener, so if, if, if in our view that we have now something to work with is positive and I think for us in Audit Scotland continuing to engage with the government, um, hearing the feedback of other stakeholders and then seeing what the next iteration looks like is the, is the way we want to take it. OK, thanks. Uh, I think we get that message. Um, I'm going to now uh, invite the Deputy Convener to put some questions to you, Jamie. Thank you, Convener. Uh, good morning. Um, I've got quite a, a broad range of areas to cover. Um, I want to start with um, taking us back to something. I think, Carol, you just said that there's still some outstanding accounts from 22-23 to be produced, published, made uh, available. <clears throat> but in correspondence from the Chief Financial Officer just uh, last week, um, we received a summary of the final outturn for 22-23. So I want to just have a quick look at that before we, because it is relevant to this year's consolidated accounts. Um, do, do, does this financial outturn take into account best guesstimates for those departments which are yet to report? Is it your understanding that there that there may be another version of the final outturn, a final final outturn, if you like? Uh, so, in terms of the the accounts that are still to be signed off, those I think almost all exist in the local government sector. Um, as you may or may not know, within the local government sector, there is a requirement to publish unaudited accounts, and therefore that information is. Avail publicly available and was able to be used in terms of what was produced in terms of the consolidated financial information. Um, so that is within there. There could be audit adjustments absolutely within that space, but it was produced um, to, to give that, that kind of opportunity for others to look at as a starting point. Right. Um, it's interesting you picked up on local government. That is actually the only line um, in the accounts, which seems to suggest an overspend of five million, uh, every other um, budget line presented to us has a, a considerable underspend, totaling five hundred nine million. So it's half a billion. Is that normal? I mean, I, I'm perhaps new to the committee in that respect, but half a billion underspend in finance in, in, in final outturn versus budgeted um, seems like an awful lot of money. I wonder, Deputy Convener, if we, if we could just uh, page reference, actually. Yeah, so yeah, can... OK, it's probably helpful if I do that. It's, um, 
I presume this is all in the public domain before I start talking about it. Page 13 of the um, correspondence from the Chief Financial Officer. It's not your report I'm looking at, um, but it is very, it's very, very relevant. Um, if you haven't got it, we can we can look at it another time. Anyway, I just wanted to, to in, in the generality, yeah. then what you know, if, if if we look, if we think about underspend of um, when it comes to final outturn, the same will be true of 23, 24. I imagine when when we when we have that same conversation, is what what your expectations are when you you know what are you looking for when you see these huge underspend figures in the final outturn. So I think maybe just to I I have uh, I recognise the complexity first of all that the the Scottish government first of all has to break even or produce a surplus in order to um, record you know a, a regular outturn. So the as I as mentioned uh, earlier to the convener, the Scottish government. You know, yes, it is able to borrow within the confines of the fiscal framework, both in revenue and, and capital terms. Revenue borrowing, which would support, um, has also quite significant um, requirements around, you know, whether it's for a, a fiscal shock or to meet uh, a budget reconciliation for the um, for a fiscal framework outturn. So, within those constraints, it has to break even, and I think that requires really. You know, careful budget management. As we touched on in the report, Deputy Convener, they've had to the government has had to deploy interventions to ensure that it, it broke even to deliver what their project, the path to balance each year. We're making wider points of course about that, about, about how they are doing that and how in a second. But I think on in the overall totality of it, you know, so whilst I recognise that any underspend comes at an opportunity cost of not delivering the public service um, that would have been intended but they have to deliver an underspend of some description. Mm -hmm. And the percentages we're talking about of you know, less than half a percent in overall terms probably allows for some margin of error. And so I wouldn't want to be overly critical of government for producing an underspend. I think that's just the nature of how public accounting mm -hmm. in Scotland mm -hmm. works. But as I say, not to labour the point, I recognise that you know, an underspend of any description means that you know, a public service hasn't been delivered as, as was intended. And of course, these are big numbers, you know, you know, underspends of hundreds of millions of pounds. The public will look at that and think, my goodness, that could have been used to deliver a vital public service. And so I think all of these things are true. <laughs> OK, that's diplomatic. Um, I, I guess that is the point I'm making, is, is it, when we are taking evidence <clears throat> that suggests that, for example, to make ends meet, um, uh, as is required of government, uh, that um, projects are put on hold, they're reprofiled, moved into future years, um, or there's moratorium on on new capital investment, for example. So when the public say ask us why why are those schools not being built? Why is that hospital not being replaced? Why is that ferry not being built, etc.? Yet we're also producing bits of paper that, that show half a billion pounds of underspend in the final outturn. There, there are rightfully are questions asked of us, and I appreciate. The answer probably lies in complex accounting, um, but it's a straightforward question asked of Parliament, so that's the reason I raise it. If, if I may, I mean, I, again, Exhibit 3 in our um, Section 22 report today, I get set, so some of the, bud, the funding changes that, that took place and you know, the, the Path to Balance project repeatedly again this financial year, so that you know, the government identified quite early in the new financial year that the direction of travel was such that they were unlikely to deliver balance required, as you mentioned, emergency uh, spending controls. So what, what we see also is that you know, in, in a, the analysis of Exhibit 3 and some of the engagement we've had with government is that um, it's not always clear why some budgets are targeted for spending reductions or pauses against others. And similarly, making the connection between the government's priorities and then the spending <coughs> changes that take place um, is also less than apparent. <coughs> and and if, if I may, just to, to, to repeat the point I touched on in my opening statement, is that connecting that to the government's priorities would be a step forward so that the budget and the national outcomes and the update to the national performance framework make a much clearer loop about spending and outcomes and indeed, if there then needs to be changes 
in the financial year, that that's uh, more evidently consistent with the government's stated priorities as opposed to you know, budget changes that of those that are likely to be underspending and, and, mm. and better exploration of why that's the case. That's very helpful feedback. Um, you, you did mention the concept of borrowing. We're frequently told that the Scottish Government has no ability to borrow money, but it, can you maybe talk us through the National Loans Fund and how that is used? Because the presumption being that the Government can't get itself into debt per se, but there is ability to borrow when required. And where does that money come from? And what can it be used? What can it be spent on? Yeah, um, you're, you're right. The government does have the ability uh, to borrow within the confines of the fiscal framework between the Scottish and, and UK governments, and we set some of that out. Um, Exhibit four kind of just shows the trajectory um, of borrowing that the Scottish government has undertaken, uh, dating back to 2017-18. There are um, limits each year. Um, so what we report is in 23-24, the Scottish Government borrowed £300 million to support the delivery of its capital programme, um, lower than the £450 million cap that is um, within the fiscal framework. And equally, as you rightly mentioned, Deputy Convener, um, they borrow from the National Loans Fund. Terms vary depending on you know, the... Uh, the nature of projects or, or what's agreed between um, the National Loans Fund and the Scottish Government. Um, what we look to do in today's report is just really to set out the increasing amounts that are being borrowed. And of course, with borrow, it comes with interest and principal and, and repayments. Um, so um, just again, to address your point directly, um, the Scottish Government does have borrowing powers. It, it is able to borrow for capital uh, project purposes. And as I mentioned earlier on, with more restrictive uh, circumstances, that has, it also has some limited uh, resource borrowing powers too. Okay, so just to be just looking at your own report, um, uh, as of the end of March this year, the total capital borrowing outstanding was one point seven six billion pounds, and the amount borrowed for capital projects was less than the cap, essentially. So there was there still is. A bit of wriggle room there. If they wanted to borrow more money, there would be more money available. For example, for capital projects. Yeah, so so that's correct. I think there is. I mean, I'll bring Helen in actually. Just maybe can sit, say a bit more about the um, the totality of it. There's, there's been some recent developments. For example, uh, some of the the caps are now inflated, um, whereas in, in previous iterations of the fiscal framework that that wasn't the case. But Helen might want to say a bit more. Thank you. Fiscal framework was uh, was, uh, was 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 brought forward. It was was announced in August 2023. 20, it was updated at that point, and as you've heard, um, the, the figures were all uprated for inflation, or are now going forward uprated for inflation. And per that fiscal framework, it says you can borrow up to three billion for capital with a limit of four hundred and fifty million. And for revenue, or for, for 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 ongoing day-to-day -day expenditure, they can borrow up to six hundred million. Um, so, so there are there, there are controls there in place, set out in theory, um, that they can they can overspend those limits. The issue is around the interest rates that are incurred as a result of taking out that, that those 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 loans. All loans are are processed via the the SCF, which is a separate set of accounts. So that's why you don't see the outstanding loans within these right. with, within these, these these accounts just now. That's really helpful. Thank you. That's these are perhaps questions for for government departments in future. Um, can I move the conversation on to the issue of um, strategic commercial assets, which your report very helpfully does some analysis on? I mean, just as an overall point, um, the. Uh, strategic Commercial Assets Division is a fairly new venture in terms of governance. Um, my understanding is it employs around 40 headcount and also spends a, I'll, I'll use the word considerable, that's subjective, amount of money on external consultants uh, last year, 1.6 million. Uh, is there any indication of the cost of that operation uh, to government? Uh, and it, in your opinion, is that does that present as, as good value uh, as a division? Because it's a fairly new new setup. So there's, there's a couple of things there. That, um, we had 
casting my mind back maybe three or four years ago, uh, made recommendations in audit reports to the Scottish Government that they needed to develop a stronger set of internal arrangements to manage their financial interventions. So I think what we see, and indeed the evidence that the committee has heard from the Director General for the Economy, uh, uh, led to the creation of the Strategic Commercial Assets Division and much closer monitoring of the interventions that they uh, have made and perhaps a better expertise for allowing them to consider future opportunities. So I think that they have, they have done that, Deputy Convener. What we haven't done in, through our audit work is to um, make an assessment of does that represent value for money yet? You know, is, there a, um, is there an alternative way of doing this? And, you know, yes, there would be alternatives. I'm, I'm sure that would come at a different cost. But what we haven't done is say, well, and how effective is the, uh, the SCAD division in its operation so far? That, that remains open to us. Um, and, and indeed, um, we are, you know, we'll give that due reflection as to through either the audit of the Scottish Government um, or our uh, forward work programme of performance audits, the, how the government is, I think, in the, in the round, delivering on uh, its ambitions for economic growth, which I'm sure SCAD uh, and the expertise that lies in there will play an important part. So I think it's one for us for the future rather than making an assessment today. OK. Um, it's an observation more than anything. I'm not necessarily criticising its presence, but 40 people is a lot of folk, and there really are only, only two strategic commercial assets which are wholly owned by the public, and another two which have seen public financial intervention. So it's not a huge portfolio to manage, if that makes sense. And also, we often hear that these are independent, self-managing organisations with their own uh, executive management teams and directorships and, and reporting mechanisms. So therefore, it seems well, you know, I guess the question for a future day is, is it overkill or is it, being, is it effectively doing its job? Whilst it's responding to your previous recommendations, I understand that. So. Yeah, I think that's where, that's where we're at. I mean, if I may broaden that out, if, if you're content, I think you know, we do talk in the report about um, the growth in the public sector workforce and the progress um, of public service reform and the need for uh, fiscal sustainability to be um, addressed in, in the years to come. And inevitably, in our view, that management of the workforce will have to play an important part of that. And I think that reflects government's own uh, reporting on it, where they've identified the need, uh, using their words, to, to right-size the public sector workforce um, in Scotland. The extent to which that you know, incorporates the Strategic Commercial Assets Division or otherwise, I think it's something that we haven't yet seen and, and will return to in due course. Thank you very much for that. look forward to that. Um, this is the point where I ask you to help me um, understand um, what is reasonably complex auditing language into layman's terms for both politicians and the wider public, perhaps, who are not qualified in this regard. Um, I, can we turn to Exhibit 2, which is around the specific strategic commercial assets, Presswick Airport, Ferguson Marine, Port Glasgow, and, of course, um, the Liberty, Liberty um, Smelter and BIFAB. Um, I just wonder if you could help me understand what it is you're reporting here. Um, it's something that, that this committee and others have had, had a, a strong interest in for a number of years. Um, there's obviously that the, each of these uh, entities will have a perceived value, uh, as the government has stated, that there's an intention to return them to private ownership in future. But alongside that, there's also the issue of um, the money that's already been invested by the public purse into these businesses, normally by way of loans, and some of which appear on the balance sheet in the consolidated accounts. So could you just talk us through what, what you're seeing at the moment? What's mm. the bigger picture there in terms of these specific assets? Let's start with Presswick, perhaps, shall we? Yeah, very happy to. Um, and Carol, please come in and if there's anything that uh, I haven't covered. The, the intention behind this uh, reporting convener is uh, one of consistency, uh, first of all. So we've been reporting for um, a number of years through the Section 22 and, and the consolidated accounts, the investments that the Scottish Government has made uh, in private companies. Um, 
their value and then any how they're recording thereafter mm -hmm. or any changes uh, to, to the nature of those investments. And there are some changes uh, this year, both uh, particularly in terms of um, the valuation that can happen as a result of uh, circumstances re relevant uh, to those individual bodies. Um, I mean, hopefully, if the the nature of Presswick, Glasgow Presswick Airport, I suppose, is one of, as you mentioned, it's a wholly owned investment now of, of the Scottish Government. Um, the specific point we are making today is in terms of the value that's recorded in the consolidated accounts of this asset that has changed, if you refer back to the similar table in last year's report, was at £11.6 million and has now increased to 21.2. You rightly mentioned that that was in regard of loan finances that the Scottish Government had made um, to the airport and now reporting that the recoverability of those loans um, is higher than it would have been at this point last year. Right. Um, if I'm, I'll move past to Carol because I think one of the key points that, that we need to do in the annual audit is to make an assessment of is the government's valuation process reasonable, is it robust, have they taken uh, advice from suitably qualified valuers and so forth. So if you're happy to pause at that one for an initial point, I can uh, bring Carol in. Yeah, and in doing so, I mean, I, I guess that is the question. We know that we know the total value of money invested mm. in the public purse, and we know what they thought may be recoverable, um, or what the, the, the value of that, that loan would be, not necessarily the value of the business mm. itself, which is a whole other conversation which we could have. Um, but it seems to have jumped up massively on the balance sheet. So, I, I, you know, what, are, are you confident that they've given sufficient rationale for what is almost a doubling of the value of the, the recoverable value of those loans? Yeah, so for each of the, the financial interventions within Exhibit 2, um, the final column, the value in the consolidated accounts, what I can say is we have done the, the audit work that you would expect in that. So we have looked at the, the judgments that are made and the estimates included within that. Um, we have drawn on our own expertise um, and challenged round about that. In our annual audit report, um, I don't know if you have that, but um, there's more detail because when we're reporting to those charged with governance, we go into each of these key judgments and estimates in more detail. Um, as you said about the accounting for it and the work we've done specific because we recognise these as risks to, of material misstatement. That's the terminology we use in terms okay. of auditing the accounts. So we do very detailed, focused work. Um, for each of these estimations that are included within the accounts, and we are content that they are they are accurate and not materially misstated. Okay, and uh, what, what sort of I mean, just just to put it into sort of simplistic terms, what, what are the sort of reasons that the government would present as um, rationale for increasing these numbers? So, for example, Presswick is, is, is doubled um, with Ferguson Marine. Um, albeit it's still a, a small percentage of the money that's been invested, but that's the value of the three hundred and four million pounds invested is now sitting at ninety four million so it's, it's less than a third um, but that has increased year on year so w what are the factors that that you're seeing that give you comfort that those are true and accurate assumptions yeah so we we'll look, we'll look at a suite of um, audit evidence to support that. Um, we speak to our own um, experts in certain areas. So, for example, in asset valuations, um, we can look beyond, you know, to, to other um, places where we deal with um, valuations. So that would be for the, the vessels. Um, that's obviously the valuation of a, an asset in terms of uh, the, the, the the vessels. Um, whereas for Presswick, as you said, it's it's about the recoverability of the loan. Um, so it's it's a similar breadth of audit approach within that, but there's specific evidence that we look for in each of these cases. Um, it isn't the presenting of um, rationale round about it, it is about the specifics that we can see in terms mm -hmm. of the audit evidence, so you know what the loan is currently sitting at, um, what the market is looking like, all of these things you know, feed into it, and how the airport, in this case, is performing. I'm getting a sort of feeling of antiques roadshow, though it's only worth something if someone's willing to pay for it. So how do you how do you marry what they put on the consolidated accounts and value of loans? Which, I mean, it, you know, at what point it, do you do you say, or as general, that the government's not been realistic about their opportunity to recover these investments? So they could very well just upfront say, look, we're going to write them off. We don't expect any 
future owner of these assets to give us any of that money back? Or is there a pretense that they may get some of that money back and it's just a, a risk assessment on how much they might get, how much they might recover? It sounds, it sounds like a very subjective approach to, to, to what's been invested and how much might be lost. So it's generally the latter. So it, it, it's an indication of the recoverability of the loans. So, it's, so there are no guarantees, you know, and, and circumstances will dictate um, if and when the asset is disposed, mm. what's recoverable in terms of the investment that the government has made into it. And as you rightly point out, that can depend upon the willingness of the buyer and the seller to agree a mutual satisfactory price. And what what you have today is really a it's, this is a, a balance sheet judgment, it's, and is the balance sheet and the set of accounts. It's a, it's a snapshot of what it is, right up to the date of the, the certification of the accounts. So, when the principal accountable officer signs the accounts uh, in was it early October, and then uh, I, I certify the audit opinion, is to say that these are true and fair. So it's not a guarantee that th this will be you know, what happens you know, 12 months from now or, or beyond. But there's, un there's inevitably a degree of uh, fluctuation, I think, as you've seen in the valuation from what, what the recoverability of the loans uh, 12 months ago, is giving the reader of the accounts the best uh, figure that they can arrive at today. Um, but as you probably hear in Deputy Governor, there, there are caveats uh, around that figure as, as we go forward. While we're on the issue of um, commercial assets, um, I may jump ahead to the issue of Ferguson Marine and the assets themselves. Uh, your report specifically picks out the issue of the MV uh, Glen Rosa and Glen Sanux. Um, so, the estimation to complete the vessels still sits at around £300 million. I think that's your understanding. Um, however, you do um, present some criticism in, in your report around the due diligence on value for money. Could you talk us through your concerns over that? Yes, I'm happy to. And again, I'll. I'll um Turn to Carol to, to set in a bit more detail. I think for the uh, the committee, the, the nature of those concerns. What we reference in today's section 22 report, and, and indeed as Carol and Helen have covered in their uh, underlying annual audit report that they present to uh, to the Scottish government, is that the committee will recall that uh, a due diligence exercise, which was then led to uh, a request for written authority from Scottish ministers from the Director General for the Economy when he wasn't satisfied that the value for money test for continued investment, what was uh, Vessel 802 now in Glen Rosa, hadn't been met. Today's report brings to the Committee's attention that the price has increased um, since the uh, initial S uh, value, uh, AO assessment was made of £203 million, pounds, that the cost is now increased to a projected £299 million. In our view, that should have led to a further uh, value for money assessment being undertaken, Deputy Convener, and that hasn't yet happened. And we think that uh, should have been an important step for the government to undertake so that it was satisfied that it was still the case that written authority and the associated continuation of the project represented uh, value for money. Um, Carol can come in and say a bit more about uh, that process. Thank you. Um, so when the cost to complete both vessels increased to £240 million in September last year, um, the Scottish Government requested that FMPG do detailed scrutiny. They were looking for that confirmation that that was an accurate kind of total figure to complete both vessels before doing um, due diligence. As a result of that detailed analysis, the cost increased to 200, just under 300 million, the 299 million um, in February. What we are saying within the report, what the Auditor General is saying, is that at that point, that increased cost, which it does appear to have stabilised at that level, it hasn't increased since, should have been subject to the due diligence um, to ensure that it continuing to, with the build of, of MV Glen Rosa, was representing value for money. Um, we understand that part of the, the delay in relation to that was um, the Scottish Government assessing how much they could um, complete the due diligence internally with the expertise that they had with the previous work that was done, as you know, with the use of consultants um, to support that. 
whether there was a need for consultants again this time or could they complete it um, with the expertise they had. Um, that has been part of the, the delay. Um, but as the Auditor General has said, it, it is critical that it is concluded um, to offer that insight into the, the value for money assessment for continuing um, mm -hmm. with the, the MV Glen Rosa. I mean, Auditor General, you, you'll be aware that, that both these vessels were supposed to cost under £100 million pounds for both. Um, and the latest figure, well, back in March, it was £300 million that I, My suspicion is that they, that they may have gone up since then, given further problems that have, they've encountered at, at the yard. Um, you, you don't state it, although you do allude to it, but it doesn't sound like value for money. Is that your assessment? So we've, we're not in a position to make that judgment yet. They have to convene our thing. Uh, I guess the sequencing of that is that that should come from the accountable officer, first of all. So that uh, the Director General for the Economy, and I think we understand that that, that process is you know, uh, due to complete soon, that will give a, a position upon which um, allows me to progress with my stated intention to complete further work um, on the... Uh, on the delivery of these two vessels. Uh, I've been clear in my intention to, to do that uh, at the end of the project, uh, which will make a, a more rounded assessment of the project, uh, including value for money, and anticipate, uh, depending on timescales, that will be during 2025 or, or early 26. But just from a, from a, from a, a public uh, expenditure point of view, is, is there a risk, though, that, that this if that three million hundred million became three hundred and fifty or four hundred, and it just endlessly spirals. At, w at what point is there a mechanism for for intervening and in, in, in saying, look, you can't just keep chucking money at something endlessly? You know, what 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 is the cutoff? At vers you know, when you look at budget versus what's actually being spent, when things are going so massively over budget by hundreds of millions of pounds in a very short space of time. They seem like massive incremental jumps, mm -hmm. not, not little uh, increments of, of overspend. So the, the, the process for, uh, for checks and balances and you know, ultimately to intervention is one within government. And I think what you've seen evidence of uh, uh, fairly is that uh, an account accountable officer reached a view that continue to spend on a particular capital project, in this case the uh, ongoing investment in uh, Glen Rosa, wasn't, in their view, going to deliver value for money. And in those circumstances, that then leads to a request for written authority from ministers right. to continue to, to uh, spend in however way they choose through the, you know, the totality of the budget or, or moving funds or prioritising other projects. Um, for completeness, Deputy Governor, I don't have any powers of, of intervention to, to um, on a particular uh, spending of policy decision. I think that's the right process. That, you know, for the audit function is of a retrospective activity to make a judgment about uh, how public spending has been undertaken and a value for money assessment of my own uh, in due course. But I think as a project is live those responsibilities rest with the interaction between accountable officers as set out in the Public Finance Manual um, and ministers for the policy intent. But here's the conundrum. If the accountable officer identifies that there's going to be a, a, an additional cost and it's fairly substantial and in their view it does not present value for money to mm -hmm. the public, yet ministers will make ministerial decisions as is their prerogative to, to put more money into that project. Um, what is your role in terms of that process? Because that clearly there's a process being followed, but it's not necessarily leading to good outcome in terms of value for money. So, um, you know, what are you looking to see from the government moving forward on this if there are further cost overruns? I think it's so perhaps drawing on the experience that uh, myself and indeed the committee, because I think the, the committee has a key role in this uh, process too, that the accountable officer um, or, or the minister in those circumstances will write to both the, uh, the clerk of the committee and myself to bring to our attention that a written authority has been requested by an accountable officer. And um, the detail and the circumstances uh, of ministers' judgments as to whether to grant written authority or to change the terms um, of a project. So I think in public transparency, um, we have that through that process. Um, by way of my own work, um, I, I have discretion in terms of my forward work programme. What I'm clear on is that 
there is of sufficient public spending and public interest mm -hmm. in the investment that the Scottish Government has made in its ferry fleet to warrant further audit work. And that's my intention, you know, so both in my ongoing uh, audit and the appointing the auditors of Ferguson Marine Port Glasgow, now of course a, a public body, uh, and through this report in the Scottish Government, and then my intention to do further audit reporting uh, on the totality of this project to support Parliament and public scrutiny and understanding of how well public spending has, has been made on these projects. OK, look forward to that work if it occurs. Thank you. OK, thank you. Um, before we move off uh, this area, could I just ask uh, whether you can update us on whether the GFG Alliance has appointed auditors and whether or not it has filed audited accounts? Um, so, Convener, I was uh, looking, uh, and colleagues have been uh, in engaging with Scottish Government in more detail, so Carol might want to say a bit more, but uh, I don't think we have uh, confirmation that that is yet the case. So uh, understand that um, through uh, reading some of the communication from Companies House that there was some enforcement action that was initiated against the uh, GFG group for uh, not filing accounts. Um, but I don't think I've got a, an up-to-date position of whether that uh, has yet changed. But I'll just turn to Carol if we've got any more detail, Convener. So my understanding is that that hasn't changed um, and that the, the refinancing process is still underway. OK, I mean, as the Auditor General, do you have a view on that? I think I would repeat what I, I stated publicly uh, to the committee, if it was 12 months ago or, or, or two years ago, that um, the Scottish Government will need to be satisfied about the financial position of uh, one of its uh, key partners and, and the, the nature of the, the financial guarantee. The provision of audited accounts gives <coughs> uh, investors such as the Scottish Government this company, you know, additional forms of assurance. The absence of those you know, would be a matter of concern uh, for the Government and the Parliament. So I th my, my position remains the same, Convener. It, is a, it remains a matter of concern and we would you know, be keen to that the Government, in the absence of those counts, how they are, are satisfying themselves through SCAD or others, that uh, the financial position of their key partner um, is understood and what, what plans the Government have accordingly. Yeah, because this is also a company, isn't it, which has been investigated by the Series Fraud Office for uh, money laundering, suspected fraud um, and fraudulent trading. I mean, d are these factored into the uh, assessment that's made about the exposure to risk of the investment arrangement? I think you've previously described it as being a complex transaction mm. between the Scottish Government and uh, GFG Alliance. Uh, around the Lacaba smelter. Um, so, you, you probably not uh, not expect me to comment, convener, on the the nature of ongoing investigations of um, of the serious uh, fraud office. But I think it just confirms that where there is uncertainty in the financial position um, of a key partner, I think both from, from our perspective that the government is clear on how it's valuing its investment. Um, any plans, I any mean, contingency scenario planning that it's doing around um, the sustainability um, of that investment. And we've captured that in our auditing of the, the investment of um, uh, and the disclosure of the uh, Loch Haber smelter. Um, but it, perhaps as a wider point, the government has, and I think through SCAD, has increased its expertise with which it is able to make a more rounded assessment of how it selects its partners and then the ongoing monitoring of it. But it doesn't detract from the point that this is clearly a matter of concern. The, the absence of um, filed accounts uh, for any company would one that um, the government would want to take a view on. OK, before I bring in Colin Beattie, but and just related to this, I mean, we've been told, uh, I think, that the government's carrying out a transparency review of its uh, commercial assets. Have you had any input into that? Um, I'm, I haven't personally um, had uh, any input in that, and I think, uh, no, that's not something uh, that the audit team has yet uh, either, convener. Um, I, I should say, you know, we would be, of course, happy to engage um, with the government, uh, should they so wish, but I think particularly, you know, as I mentioned to the deputy convener a moment or two ago, one of the intentions around uh, reporting on the interventions was to improve transparency um, over that. So. Uh, not having seen the terms of reference on that, but I can generally say that that feels like a positive development. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, I'm now going to um, bring in Colin Beatty to put some questions. Colin. Thank you, Commissioner. Well, General, I'd like to have a wee look at uh, financial pressures first. Um, I've always thought that over the last few years the financial pressures have been increasing year by year. So I was interested in your comments that uh, the funding challenge for 23-24 was lower than that in 22-23. <coughs> Why was that? So I think these were, you know, you're right that the 23-24, um, uh, Mr Beattie, felt like something of a lull in terms of the, the pressures on government finances compared to 22-23 reference. And I think also what we are observing during the course of the 24-25 financial year in terms of um, interventions, P particularly I think the, the, the difference between 23-24 and, and the current financial year is the extent of public sector pay that has now been agreed and is factored into the baseline of financial years as we move forward. Those arrangements um, hadn't been placed uh, during the 23-24 financial year. But I don't think it, it... I think this is all relative to an extent. Mr Beauty, I think, you know, for reference to the committee, uh, Exhibit 3 again, just you know, illustrating the scale of changes that have taken place uh, across the Scottish Government's uh, departmental budgets, still shows that they've had to deploy very close and careful management of its financial position to ensure break-even. Mm. I mean, quite obviously, as has been touched on already, the financial pressures are being met. That includes pay deals plus the inflationary pressures that uh, are, are just as harsh on our budget. They're doing this through one-off reductions. How... How feasible is it for the government to actually make the structural changes and so on that are needed, which usually require capital themselves mm -hmm. to put in place, to enable a long-term step change in the way that uh, the budgets are uh, put together and administered? So I wouldn't wish to present to the committee this morning that this is um, an easy or straightforward thing to do. But we think it is possible and we absolutely think it's a necessary step to support um, financial balance in the years to come, that there is clarity about how public services will be delivered and what is affordable. Um, and there are, there are various strands to that and, and, and a, you know, we are um, finalising our work on one of what we think is one of the key components of that in terms of progress around public service reform and to use your word, the structural nature of how those services are delivered. What we're seeing up until now is generally one-off or non-recurring steps that have been taken to deliver financial balance, Mr Beatty, rather than the clarity that's necessary of a longer-term plan around financial position and public service delivery. Um, there, are some many, there are some excellent examples of public service reform that have taken place up until now, but not, a, not clarity of a longer term direction of travel of how public services are delivered. But I agree with the point you make that this is complex, but the sustainability of public services um, is, requires that, that complexity to be worked through. It seems to me, looking right across the public sector, not just questioning these consolidated accounts for the government, but for uh, local government, for all the organisations that I've come in contact with, they seem to be working on the basis of one-off fixes to get them through that year. It seems to be endemic, wherever there's public funding, that people are trying to save money, but not on a recurring basis, or not, to, or not the bulk of it on a recurring basis. What is, if, if that continues unchanged, what will happen? So, first of all, I, I recognise the characterisation characterization, uh, of the challenges that public bodies are facing, and it echoes much of uh, my own reporting over the past few years. And the committee will be familiar with the reporting we make on the NHS in Scotland through our annual report. Uh, the next iteration of that will be published um, over in the course of the next few weeks. 
that non-recurring savings have been a prolonged feature of the delivery of um, fiscal sustainability, financial balance on an in-year basis. Um, it's consistent with the reporting that the Accounts Commission are making in their work on local government in Scotland, and also uh, references the judgments that auditors and public bodies are making when they report in their own annual report and accounts. So non-recurring savings, very challenging uh, fiscal position for public bodies, um, is clear, Mr Beattie. If we don't address it, then we move into a cycle or, or we remain in a cycle of in-year interventions in, on, in financial position to deliver financial balance. Not necessarily a clarity of whether that's the best decision, but perhaps the most straightforward one to deliver financial balance. And then, as equally important, if not more so, not having the connection with outcomes about what we actually want to achieve uh, from public spending. And so not making progress on moving to a preventative approach that delivers benefits for people, communities and societies more widely. So a, a pretty dark picture, I would say, Mr Beatty, if we, if we don't make progress on this matter. Looking at the shorter term, I, I hate the term challenges, but how, how much of a challenge is it actually going to be to address the funding pressures that we're going to see in 25-26 in the budget cycle? Um, so the most recent information that we have um, draws on the, the government's uh, projections informed by the work of the Scottish Fiscal Commission of on a, on a, a range of scenarios that, that they'll deploy, but the mid-scenario, the one that they consider to be most likely, is of a billion pound gap. And some of that will be updated for the uh, the UK budget over the course of, of the past few weeks. But I think, as I've uh, heard, the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and Local Government confirmed that it's still very challenging um, financial position. So a billion pounds, you know, crudely, less than 2% of you know, annual public spending, but very important and very difficult uh, to, to bridge, Mr Beatty. So there is, there is much work to be done and clarity, I think, will help from a clear programme of uh, medium-term financial reporting um, and, as, uh, um, and a reference, I think, over the past day or so, just the judgments of the Finance and Public Administration Committee about the need for uh, improvements in medium-term financial planning and reporting that will help make some of these decisions. You touched on the UK budget, and there's still quite a lot of uncertainties around how that's going to work in terms of how much we're actually going to get at the end of the day, or how much is going to be taken away after it's been given to us. Um, is there any indications that that's going to alleviate some of, the, some of the pressures, or is this simply going to be absorbed by pay rises, which won't contribute to the public services? I think probably all I'm able to say uh, in a, an informed way at the moment is I think that that remains to be seen as to what the, the, the in-year benefit um, will be and how it will be used or whether there is a, a additional uh, financial headroom that becomes available for some of these choices to address uh, the, the challenges that the, the Scottish Government is facing. Um, from an audit perspective, is something that we'll, we'll consider as part as we finalise our reporting um, on our fiscal sustainability work and then build that into our assessment of public spending uh, on, on the 24-25 audit year that we'll report next year. Previously, we talked, or you, or, or you talked uh, briefly about, uh, in response to Jimmy Green's question about how the decisions of the Scottish Government to balance the budget is feeding into policy priorities mm -hmm. and how that's evidenced. And if I'm remembering correctly, you said there's no evidence as to that happening. How is the government going to handle this going forward? Because clearly there's going to be budget pressures uh, right across the board, no matter what the UK <coughs> budget contributes. How, are, are they aware of this? Are they, are, they, are they going to work out how they're going to align these cuts? So I think, yeah, there's a couple of points I'll try and cover, Mr Beatty. I think what we say in the report today is it's difficult to see um, 
how the reductions in portfolio spending align with the Scottish Government's clear priorities. We know that there are a couple of milestones coming that, that the Government is targeting that um, they hope will give them better clarity as to how they can um, profile their spending in year and the years, years to come. So the, I think the noting the UK Government um, spending review process that's due to take place in the spring of next year as being an enabling factor for them to produce um, an updated medium-term financial strategy, uh, a revised infrastructure investment pipeline plan, and then also a third strand, what they're referring to as a fiscal sustainability delivery plan. The first two of those, I think that I am and the, the committee will be familiar with as being how the government intends to manage its uh, financial position. The fiscal sustainability delivery plan that the Cabinet Secretary for Finance and Local Government announced is a new component of that that I think signals the recognition of the, the fiscal sustainability challenges that the government has and what steps that they hope to take. From our perspective, I think we're looking to see you know, additional clarity around how public service reform fits into that suite of plans, Mr Beattie, um, and you know, very clearly the, the, the first few months of next year will be fundamental to, to have, bring clarity to how the government plans to address longer term uh, fiscal sustainability and the delivery of public services therein. Uh, earlier on, in response to a question from Jamie Green, we were talking about government borrowing and uh, how far the government could borrow and how far it was borrowed. I'm rather more concerned about the financial pressure regarding repayments and interest payments. Because if we look at, uh, at uh, interest payments in 2023-2024, uh, loan repayments we're going to be 217 million against 160 million in 22-23. Now, I think that's just the loan repayments and not the interest, uh, if I'm interpreting that correctly. No, it includes the interest. So it's loan repayments plus interest. That's quite a big increase. I mean, that's 57 million, which as a percentage of the whole budget isn't much, but, you know, it, it, it's adding to the, the, the pressures that the government's under. How affordable is it to fund resource expenditure in particular from borrowings? So Helen can say a bit more about some of the, the detail and the arrangements for, um, for borrowing. Particularly on the point firstly though about uh, resource borrowing. So these amounts are being repaid. So I think an indication that the Scottish Government is managing its obligations for borrowing, whether it's capital and, or, or resource, uh, and making repayments of both interest and principal to, to the National Loans Fund in accordance uh, with those agreements. The wider point is true, though, that you know, the more that you borrow, whether for resource or capital, the repayment of principal and interest uh, has to be factored into your wider priorities. Resource borrowing, though, remains a small, a much smaller component of, of borrowing and, and still has you know, uh, what's in, tighter sets of arrangements about what you can deploy resource borrowing for. So uh, more typically for uh, fiscal shock, such as uh, was used during uh, COVID times, um, and then alongside that, where there's a significant reconciliation between uh, for, for block grant adjustments, once the fiscal outturn is known a number of years down the line that, uh, that the committee will be familiar with. Helen might want to say a bit more, Mr Beattie, but I think it is another component of what has to be managed in terms of the government's financial position as, as further borrowing takes place over the over years to come. Helen. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, so, yes, just to confirm those figures of 217 and 160 include principal and accrued interest that was paid each, each year. Um, so, yeah, as I said previously, they are constrained by the fiscal framework, which was updated in August 2023. And, and, and also just to say that the, the sort of level of debt that we've got in Exhibit 4 really reflects the fact that they're starting from such a low base over such a short time period as well. So, so, so that's why there's, 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 there's quite a steep rise in it too. Um, the, the, the repayment of all loans is built into the budget process, so they are building it in to ensure that they, they can pay off debt each year. 
and page 18 of the consolidated accounts actually refers to the fact that there's 1.8 billion capital borrowing outstanding in total and 476 billion of day-to-day -day, day -day borrowing outstanding as well. Um, it's all tightly managed um, and as I say it's all built into to, to, to each year's uh, sort of um, aims and in, in, in how they plan to spend their, their sort of uh, funding going, going forward as well. Thank I mean, you. Looking for, just as a matter of interest, how much are the interest rates on the resource borrowing and so on? Do we have a figure? No, sorry. Apologies, I, 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 believe I, I think it varies depending on the the interest rate um, prevailing at the time or you know, informed by um, UK gilts and so forth, Mr BTS. So it's people. not fixed for a period? You know, you, you, it's not a three-month uh, period in which they will fix that rate. It's literally borrowing by borrowing. It's different. Yeah, I think I need, we need to check into the detail. Unfortunately, I think I'll come back to the committee with any additional information that we have about whether or not... So, so the rate fluctuates... Because clearly these loan, these are built up of a succession of many different loans, some with different interest rates and different term. You know, some you know, between ten and, and twenty-five years that the government will borrow from. I think what we what we don't have the detail in front of us today, unfortunately, is to whether there's a, an additional uh, interest rate that's applied during the course um, of the loan, if there's any trigger events. Um, so we can certainly look into that, or, or indeed the government themselves might be able to give you more detail. You said there's a lot of different loans. Mm. Do they hypothecate these loans against a particular budget stream? And it, is it taken <coughs> from there or is it just taken from the big pot? Um, Helen can say a bit more about that in a moment. But actually, it, it reminds me of a point that we've discussed with the committee uh, on a number of occasions, that what we, what we hadn't seen from the, the borrowing that the Scottish Government was making was it's allocation against a particular capital against a particular project and the connection that with you know, whether it was uh, investment in uh, an aligned to a departmental capital. I remember the, the committee received evidence from the Scottish Government that said it was, it was more used in the round for capital purposes as opposed to you could map a particular loan that was drawn down uh, to uh, a project. Our position was that the better clarity about you know, how public uh, borrowing uh, was being made and what it was being used for to support transparency and parliamentary scrutiny. But, but Helen might be able to say a bit more. Yes, yeah, so it's, I think, as, as you've heard, the capital borrowing is used in, in, in the, the actual round. Mm -hmm. They actually decide on the amounts that they want to, 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 to take on board as they get towards the, 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 the end of the year and they're more clear on the outturn position. So it's, it's very much a, an ongoing process trying to map expenditure and what, what, what funding is, is need, they, they sort of need, need, need to get to, to sort of pay for the work that is ongoing. It's, it seems to me that it should be possible to link the borrowing to particular projects, either one project or multiple projects, because they must, you know, there must be some correlation between what you're borrowing and what you're spending it on. So that was our position, Mr. Beatty. I think we we felt that there was more scope to be clear about uh, how much was being borrowed and what it was being used for. I I, I think to, I have some sympathy with the government's position on it that it you know gives them flexibility, perhaps if they know uh, in the round. But I think there's, there was scope for better clarity about what was being borrowed. And again, maybe that's something that you know, the committee will see next year with an updated infrastructure investment plan about uh, how it uh, is going to be funded along with the progress of the delivery of individual projects. Because there are a few projects out there coming up over the next year or two where there's uh, PFI projects maturing, which could carry a certain amount of capital cost, depending on which options are taken under the agreement. And uh, that could be quite substantial. It would be good to be able to see them coming down the line. Yeah, we'd agree with that. Just a couple of last quickies. Um, this increased borrowing and, of course, the interest payments and so on that go with it, that must be hitting the headroom that the government's got for things like pay deals and so on. Um, so, I, 
it's, it's in the round, I think particularly the borrowing and the repayments um, become an increasing cost to uh, a requirement on the Sc Scottish Government's overall financial position. Pay deals, by their nature, will be uh, resource, um, so, and I think there will be restrictions on what the government, as we've touched on, so they won't be able to borrow to to fund uh, pay deals. But it's perhaps illustrative of you know there's increasing complexity and pressures um, on the Scottish budget, as we we touch on the report as we mentioned this morning. But pay deals are baked in, to the, so they they become the new bottom line for government expenditure from, as we roll from from one year to the next. I think our report hopes to kind of set out, Mr Beattie, that increasing pressure, complexity, and all the more reason that, that there needs to be better clarity about the government's uh, intended management of financial position in the years to come, together with public service reform clarity too. Is there any sign of a link between the increase in borrowing and the decrease in availability of uh, financial transactions? Um, I, I'm not sure there is a direct connection between those. I think the... Um, the, the financial transactions budget, um, and I haven't seen the UK budget, there, there is still a small amount available to Scotland, but these have to be the, the terms and conditions of financial transactions means that they have to be given outside of the public sector. So, you know, um, so um, their presence is significantly reduced. And so, I mean, to, if I suppose to step back from it, it may be that the government then looks to deliver upon its priorities in a different way. Um, so, um, but I think what is clear that you know, financial transactions aren't going to be a dominant feature now in how it delivers capital projects. I think the reason I was wondering if there's some sort of correlation is because financial transactions, if I recall correctly, were extensively used by SNIB, and uh, you know, with that withdrawal, the funding, you know, the capital will have to come from someplace else in order to top SNIB's uh, pot up. Um, so, so I guess the detail that's something actually we can um, confirm. We can share more de with the committee as part of our audit of the Scottish National Investment Bank that we are currently undertaking to report in the spring of next year about the funding of the bank, uh, progress upon its uh, missions, um, and if you're content, must be something keen to get into a bit of detail with the committee uh, when we f once we finalise that work. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. That's great. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'm going to go uh, immediately now to uh, James Dornan, who's got some questions for you, uh, and he's joining us online. James. Thank you, convener. Um, Stephen, you were talking about public, you mentioned public sector reform earlier on, I think in response to Jamie Green. Uh, I've just got a couple of questions around that. To what extent have the updates from the Scottish Government provided a clear roadmap for the design and delivery of Scottish public services? So, good morning, Mr Dorn. Uh, yes, you're right. We've touched on public service reform, I suppose, not just this morning, but also in a theme of reporting that we've produced over the course of uh, the past few years, looking for greater pace and clarity around the government's intentions to, de to deliver upon their stated view that public service reform is a key component of how they'll deliver effective public services together with the role that it will play uh, in delivering uh, outcomes. Perhaps reference the committee to uh, some of the judgments that we make uh, at paragraphs 39 and 40, and effectively saying we don't think there's a clear plan for how the government will deliver public service reform or will achieve the associated uh, timescales. The government set out in the round that there will be a 10-year programme, and as I mentioned, I hope reasonably that We've seen, and the government themselves have reported, some very good examples of public service reform, uh, referencing some of the work that Disclosure Scotland, Registers of Scotland uh, have undertaken, but not yet clear view about the shape, size, the, the nature of delivery mechanisms or for public services uh, for years to come. And we think that's a vital missing piece, Mr Donan, of how uh, the public can understand public service delivery, how people who work in public services can have clarity, and then back into the connection about what it means for public spending too. Okay, you've kind of um, answered a question that I was going to ask you about the, the your understanding of the outcome of the actions, but you, you seem to think that 
Your understanding seems to be that the outcome of the actions hasn't been clear enough yet. Would that be a fair description of what you think the government's done? I think I would describe, I would agree, yes. I think I've generally described the government's approach so far as being one of a bottom-up approach of, you know, and, and genuinely extensive engagement with public bodies, uh, looking for, seeing and reporting on some of the examples of how public bodies themselves are transforming their services. And as I mentioned, a couple of organisations, and I'm sure there'll be many others where public bodies are doing that. What we think is missing, though, is a, a wider vision of the direction of travel and the round for how public service reform will progress and, and what it will achieve. Um, as, I, as I mentioned uh, once or twice, Mr Donnan, we're in the final throes of finalising our, our additional work on public service reform and um, we'll be reporting that and hopefully engaging with the committee on over the next few weeks. See, between now and the end of you finalising that, what detail would you like the Scottish Government to provide in the progress of the reform programme in the upcoming budget, for example? Yeah, I mean, I'll bring Carol in, actually, who can maybe just say, if it's helpful, just some of the engagement that we've been having with the Scottish Government. Um, I, not often to uh, say anything that Carol might uh, <coughs> offer to the committee. I don't think it's a case of, you know, we're asking for detail and not being provided. I think you know, we welcome the extensive engagement that, that we've had with the government. But it is that provision of clarity about the overall vision of public service reform from the Scottish Government's perspective. We've, we've mentioned um, during the course of our work that the, about how public services are delivered, the shape and size of the workforce, what people are asked to do, the investment in digital technology, how public bodies work together will all be factors that you know, we're keen to uh, report on and explore further with the committee. Um, but I'll pause and I'll, I'll turn to Carol, if there's any she wishes to add. Thank you. Uh, so just to confirm, there has been um, engagement. Reform has been um, a key theme uh, for the Scottish Government. Um, I would say that engagement uh, has resulted that there is a, a wider acceptance and recognition that there is a need for reform. But as the Auditor General has said, what we haven't seen and what we're looking for is that clarity round about the, the shape and size of the, the Scottish public sector in the future and, and what it should be delivering. Um, and then the milestones uh, to enable people to track progress and understand you know, the steps that have been taken and the ultimate longer term aim. And are you expecting to get any of that clarity in the near future? Is there any suggestion that that clarity will be forthcoming? So I think it's, so. Um, we hope so. I think it's probably how I would uh, I, I would leave it. I think there's a number of fiscal events pending, Mr. Don, and not least the the Scottish uh, government's own draft budget that the, the Scottish Parliament will consider. Um, I expect uh, early next month and then thereafter into the spring following the UK government spending review um, and then medium term financial strategy, fiscal sustainability delivery plan and so forth. We hope that these are the you know, enablers for the Scottish Government to allow them to you know, build on the work that they've done so far and provide clarity both about the medium term fiscal position and how public services in Scotland will be delivered to. So, um, it remains very much our focus both this year and into next to provide assurance back to the committee. Before I ask you, I've got a couple of questions around Oracle Cloud I'd like to ask you. But are you um, convinced and comfortable with the fact that the government are taking public sector reform as seriously as you'd like them to do? Or do you think it's required? There's more work to do. I think that's the judgment we reached in today's report and you know, we'll say more on in the, in the report later this month about that national clarity is our view about how Scotland, Scotland's public services, you know, what the shape, size, ask of them is to be for the years to come. As I mentioned, I think what we're seeing is some many excellent examples at a local level, but not necessarily that overarching vision of how public services, will, what they will look like for the years to come. So not to preempt our report for later this month, but I think that's, that's our position today. Okay, thank you. Just, uh, I've got a couple of questions I'd like to ask around Oracle Cloud. Uh, obviously, it was launched last month. It was a six-month delay. 
Yeah, but while you've stated your attention to report on the implementation during 2025, do you have any sense of how successful the initial implementation has been? I'll, I'll bring Helen in on this, Mr Donner, actually, because I think um, the closer to some of the, the early indications are of uh, a project that, uh, for what our understanding is, has gone as the government intended to, you know, post-launch uh, date at the start of October. For what we've heard is that they have... Uh, completed a successful pay run for their employees and have paid in, uh, bills and invoices uh, as expected um, f uh, to their suppliers. Um, what, are in what are interesting, as you, as you mentioned, is something we'll return to uh, over the course of now this year's um, audit is um, how did the project go you know, in terms of governance, leadership, project management, cost, progress? I think as I, I touched on in introductory remarks that um, uh, initial views the government underestimated the scale and complexity um, of of this program um, and as we set out at exhibit five the the cost growth in the project um, is significant um, and we in our view just warrants a, a bit of closer scrutiny from the external auditors as to some of the circumstances that led to that outturn but i'll pass to helen if there's anything she wants else she wants to cover thank you yeah. So, so yes, as you've heard, the, the programme was implemented uh, throughout October and we haven't heard anything too bad about it, let's just say. Um, we haven't looked at it in depth or, 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 or de de detail. But just to get back to the, to the cost side of it, just, just to confirm, yeah, the cost increased from 22 up to 66 million over the space of those two years. And as you've heard, the Scottish Government uh, first estimates were... were, were, were we're also due to a lack of expertise in that area. Uh, the system that it was replacing was uh, very old, well, well over 10 years old. They hadn't introduced a new system like that for, for quite some time. Um, and the cost increased also as a result of, this, of them taking a view that it wasn't a good time to introduce that new system due to the fact that they still had work to undertake. So although it was... I think we've reported in previous years it was meant to be introduced uh, uh, throughout the sort of June to end of year of 23. It then became April 24, and then it moved on to October 24. And this was to ensure that the, the system could could go as planned um, with the least, um, the least sort of... Um, Point, point is outstanding, let's say, at that, at that point that, that, that they, 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 they could bring it into play. Um, as a result of extending all these deadlines, it's obviously added to costs as well. So, so, so that's why it's, it's risen. Um, in terms of the refresh business case, which we talked about last year, the sort of, the sort of aim that was there to be between 46 and 52, and of course it has in, in, in increased since, since then. But as I said, that is due to the extension of, 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 of the project. Um, in terms of looking forwards, they have a sort of care team that will sort of work with them for the next few months um, to ensure that things uh, keep, keep on going. Um, and I think they're anticipating that, that that care team will still be in place for maybe up, up to th th three months. Um, and of course, there's costs as well with, with that. Um, and also just to confirm that in terms of the new system, we said last year as well that the new system um, is looking to bring in cost savings, obviously, going forward as well. Um, but I think that's... But there are risks, obviously, as well, I would have to add. It's not all plain, plain sort of, and straightforward yet. Thank you. Yeah. OK, that's great. Just... Um... You talk about uh, a VAT recovery, which was just the initial cost of the project to £58 million, from what's sixty-five and a half. So. What is the process for securing this VAT recovery, and is there any risk that A, it won't materialise, or B, it will be at a lower value than assumed in the accounts? Stephen, I'll probably be for you. Uh, I was planning to pass that to Helen, actually. <laughs> but, uh, so, I... Yeah, I'll, I'll yeah. let Helen lead on that one. I'll come in after. Yeah. So, so, so the process of one is one of identification of the cost and then trying to work out, obviously, what they can claim back in terms of VAT. Um, obviously, they have to talk to c 
Customs and Excise, is that their title now, I think? I'm not 100% sure. But they would have to talk to the right people in the right place to get that confirmed. We have been advised that they have, they have received back some money um, and discussions are still ongoing as to how much they'll, they'll, they'll get back um, in due course. And probably that's one that the SG could perhaps help out on here. Okay. Yeah, not terribly much to add to Helen's. I think, you know, so I guess the point you're making, Mr. Donner, until you've got the money, you don't have the money. Um, so there is um, careful management required, <laughs> engagement with the HMRC um, and the Scottish Government's uh, you know, tax advisors, I would expect, on, on the recovery um, of this amount. From our perspective, you know, whether it's £66 million or, or £58 million pounds as the spend of the project um, is still a significant capital investment that the government has made. We want to look at just what the, how that project uh, was managed in terms of uh, delivery, implementation. Uh, and it feels about right for us to come back uh, next year and, and report on that in a bit more detail. Um, again, not, particularly not just on the cost growth, which is an important factor, but is it releasing some of the efficiencies um, that the government needed and why the project was conceived in the first place. I, do, I recall uh, informing the committee I think, a couple of years ago that um, this was a necessary project. The government was running quite considerable risks um, with the system that it had in operation. It was uh, considerably past its useful life. Uh, so in terms of operational efficiencies, and the, the older systems are, the more cyber security risks um, that they will uh, encounter. So um, that really just, we haven't you know, finalised the scope of what we'll look at yet, Mr Donan, but I think these are the kind of wider factors that we're keen to explore. Can I just clarify then, Dave, before I, I finish this section off, the, as part of your report, will you be looking to see if there was value for money and, and the delay in making sure that the project was put in was the completed project as opposed to having to go back and sort things out later on? Yeah, these are the factors we'll look at. We so we've, we've wanted to explore how the Scottish Government satisfied themselves that they were delivering value for money for, for this investment and that it remained value for money as costs grew and it's really the, kind of the processes, the various gateways that they followed uh, through to the, the finalisation of the project. So, as I mentioned, we've not completed the scope yet, but those are very much in our thoughts. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Gambia. Thanks, James. Um, uh, Graeme Simpson has been able to join us, and I'm going to bring him in in a moment uh, for the last uh, few questions. But uh, before I do that, uh, could I turn to the final section of the Section 22 report, which is headed up Performance Reporting? Um, and it starts off with your uh, usual <coughs> diplomatic tone, Auditor General, where you say, the complicated landscape of priorities is hindering the achievement of outcomes. But then when we go on to look at paragraphs 66 and 67, you are a bit harder hitting uh, because you say there is an absence of clearly defined performance measures with measurable, um, with measurable outputs, targets uh, to all pro for all priority areas. You also say it is unacceptable that six indicators for the previous uh, national performance framework remain in development. <laughs> uh, so... Uh, that's uh, uh, quite a, a stiff judgment that you're making there. What are the reasons the Scottish Government give uh, for those deficiencies? So I think, first of all, I'm going to bring both Carol and Helen in on this point, convener. Um, Carol, to, to, to say uh, a bit more detail behind the progress that the Scottish Government is or isn't making in the national performance framework and the detail on the national outcomes. And Helen can say a bit more about the performance reporting that's contained in the annual report and accounts. Um, whilst appearing contradictory, I think both things are true. Um, that I th especially draw the committee's attention to perhaps reiterating what you've just uh, noted, convener. The national performance framework and the national outcomes was designed to give a rounded picture of how Scotland and Scotland's public spending is achieving outcomes. Um, it's been a recurring theme of an absence of measurable indicators, clear targets um, for many of those indicators. And as we note in the report, there are 
six indicators in the National Performance Framework that are still in development. And it leads us to, to question, if you're unable to produce an indicator to measure progress, is it a meaningful indicator of progress or how the Scottish Government wishes to measure um, its performance? I think that's where we're heading. And, you know, so we understand that the uh, Scottish Government, I know that the Permanent Secretary has taken a, a personal interest in the, the National Performance Framework and Outcomes, that that will see progress to a manageable, measurable suite of indicators that can allow Parliament, the public, users of public services, to see what is going on. Um, this feels overdue, convener. I think this, this is, there needs to be progress um, on this front. I'll, I'll say a final word about the, national, the performance report and then before bringing uh, Carol and Helen in, is that there's been progress on the performance reporting in the Scottish Government's um, consolidated accounts. Um, by way of mitigation, they are, there are many strands to how the government spends its money. And to, to capture all of that in the performance framework at the front end of the accounts requires you know, discipline and skill to make these an accessible read. So we've seen progress. But I think there's, there's still a bit more work to do that really just that better linking what's, what the numbers are reporting to what's been achieved. And, and of course, there's a, a degree of overlap within the national performance framework. So I think our position is we're hoping that both those factors come together next year and the, the consolidated accounts of the Scottish Government can show, not necessarily at a glance, but without having to root around quite thoroughly, as I think a user of the accounts has to do at the moment, to, to get a clear picture and narrative about what's actually being achieved. Um, if you're content, I mean, I'll bring Carolyn first of all and then turn to Helen. Thank you. So the, the complicated landscape is the terminology that's used here. It's the number of documents that contain commitments, um, many hundreds of commitments, um, that sit alongside the outcome, the national outcomes and how they contribute to it. And I think picking up the point earlier about the budgeting, what we are looking for is, is a streamlining, a clarity within that space that then supports budget decisions that can show how they are contributing to a smaller number of desired outcomes and commitments. Um, so that's where, you know, as we've said within the report, you know, it's about the, the current review of the National Performance Framework feels like a real opportunity um, to clarify that landscape um, and provide that, that cleaner picture um, that then supports better financial decisions as well to achieve the, the necessary decisions and the necessary outcomes. Thank you. So everything that you've heard from Carol there is what we really looked for in that front end of the accounts. There's over 50 pages there of uh, writing, <laughs> and there's a lot of it, to be quite honest. And really what the, the guidance says, that the front end of the account should be clear, readable, understandable, should help, should help the person who, is, who actually wants to read that to get an idea of how of how, the, how things are going, uh, are, are you achieving outcomes, targets, etc. Uh, and really, as we've already heard, without that being set, it's very difficult to find that in the front end. So we have seen a big improvement in that front end. They have taken this year the missions uh, that were there at a 423-24 and tried to link in actions, if you like, to be taken. But it doesn't talk about targets. Have they achieved something? It's about where they've spent, you know, this sort of cash on. So it, it's it's quite difficult to build up that you know that kind of view of of how well they 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 they, they, they are actually doing. But it definitely is better than it has been. I would say that. And uh, from talking to staff there, I think there's the hope and intention that it will uh, improve again. Well, the government's performance reporting might not be as clear as it could be, but I think your answers to those questions were very clear, and uh, there's a distinct message there which I hope that the government is listening to. Um, I'm going to ask Graeme Simpson now to come in with a final uh, couple of questions. Graeme. Thanks, uh, convener. Um, uh, apologies, uh, Auditor General, for being, being away for most of the meeting, but um, it's probably been explained. I was moving some amendments. Uh, stage two of a, a, a bill. Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm here now. So um, I want to ask you about um, sponsorship arrangements. <clears throat> so in your report, you note the 
government has implemented the recommendations set out in the independent review of its relationships with public bodies. Um, we're all aware, uh, of course, on this committee of the work you've done uh, on the uh, Water Industry Commission uh, for Scotland. Um, so I just want to ask if you've, if you've seen any evidence of the impl implementation of the recommendations following the independent review of the government's relationship with public bodies uh, and if they're leading to um, any changes. Yeah, good morning, Mr Simpson. Um, I, I think you'll see in the judgment we make in the Section 22 report that sponsorship needs to remain a key focus for the Scottish Government. And you know, whilst they've had an independent review, I think perhaps three years ago now, um, and I think in my own reporting I have noted um, that whilst you know, progress, before our work on the Water Industry Commission for Scotland, was that there had been progress, and, and Carol can say a bit more about you know, how that's manifesting itself in some of the Scottish Government's uh, internal governance arrangements and the oversight that Director General groupings uh, are applying to public bodies within their remit. Um, we are still seeing you know, a high-profile example of where sponsorship hasn't worked, and that the Scottish Government will clearly want to satisfy itself that its sponsorship arrangements um, in the round are working effectively on a day-to-day -day basis. That it's not that it doesn't take an example of you know, a failure of public spending or poor sponsorship to result in a new series of actions. That this is just a process that works effectively um, day in, day out, that they've got proper oversight, risk management, the right balance between the uh, Scottish Government interacting with the public body. No, not micromanaging it, but then not yeah. kind of letting it get on. So we, there's work to do here, Mr Simpson, no doubt. But if, if you, may I come back in, but I, may, I think it's important for the committee to hear from Carol about you know, some of the day-to-day the -day, um, changes that that review uh, has made. But, Carol. Thank you. So, yeah, following the, the Auditor General Section 22 report on the Water Industry Commission for Scotland, there was significant activity um, across the different uh, DG portfolios mm. um, within the Scottish Government. Um, there was, is a, a RAG rating system in place um, for each of the sponsored bodies and an assessment within that. But what we had seen and what was reported in the annual audit report was that that wasn't given the depth of information to really allow the, the non-executive members and, and others to, to really scrutinise the, the situation. Um, over the summer, each area has done deep dives um, into the specific arrangements, and that has highlighted um, a number of things, including in particular um, the lack of clarity in some of the framework agreements about exactly where responsibility lies, um, and all of that has been taken forward. Uh, you mentioned uh, at paragraph 55 of the Section 22 report about the independent review um, and the, the internal review of sponsorship arrangements. My understanding is that, that will be, they will be published shortly um, okay. and that will enable um, yourselves to kind of consider the, the results of that work. Okay. So in, in relation to this uh, deep dive exercise, I mean, how much, you know, have you seen that in any detail? Yes, so we, we have. We've seen the questions that were asked um, and what they're doing is compiling the actions that will flow out um, of that for each of the portfolios. And other than WIX, which we know about, um, and our work is continuing on that, um, have any other bodies been flagged up as being of concern? So there are a number of bodies that are flagged um, as being concern. Those generally are in the, the financial space, so in terms of their ability to manage their budgets and deliver the, the savings, because it, cons it, it considers everything that the, the body is doing. Um, so the, the RAG status isn't about the quality of the sponsorship, it is about how the organisation, that the public body is performing and whether the sponsor team has any concerns in that space. Um, and some of the lessons that will come out of the, the sponsorship review um, will, will also drive changes um, in terms of sponsorship teams. But are you able to say anything about, you are able to say what, what um, any of these bodies are, name any of these bodies? So, no, um, I wouldn't be naming any of those, those bodies um, in this space. But it's, it's not, 
you know, we've we spent a lot of this morning um, discussing the, the financial <coughs> challenges across the Scottish public sector. Um, so I think you know, there's there's many bodies that are uh, sh not struggling, but are working hard just now to get a safe path to balance for this financial year. I would add is that um, it, it remains our view, Mr. Simpson, that Wix is an outlier in terms of uh, behaviours, value for money. Um, as Carol's describing, I think what you're hearing is the Scottish Government responding to that to uh, bring in better arrangements. Um, it gives, and, and what should really afford them is the opportunity to intervene without Audit Scotland producing a statutory report on a public body that they have in sight. I think it is fair to say that the Scottish Government and the relevant Director General grouping you know, were taken by surprise by the events of the Water Industry Commission for mm -hmm. Scotland mm -hmm. and have now you know, are in progress of satisfying themselves that there are no other arrangements uh, like that. The, the other parallel is that of, so it's within the NHS. The, the, the Department for Health and Social Care within the Scottish Government tends to operate not on its own, but it can have some uh, slightly modified versions of, of oversight of, of health boards, for example. Um, I think they're further down that line of having a, a, a stronger assessment intervention framework that the committee uh, has heard about in, in recent years than other parts of the Scottish Government. Um, so we, we see this as a bit of a work in progress, but, but absolutely you know, one has to remain of core focus for the Scottish Government that it doesn't take an audit report and they themselves yeah. can intervene at a much earlier stage um, if information comes to their awareness. So final final question from me. I mean, Wix is one of 43 non-departmental public bodies. Um, have you done any work to assess whether uh, we're getting value for money from all of those bodies uh, and indeed is is there any merit, in, is, there, is there any overlap between what some of these bodies do? Is there any merit to um, amalgamating any of them in, in terms of value for money? Um, so ultimately the size and shape of public service delivery is a, is a matter for the Scottish Government and, you know, and much of that will be a policy decision which you know, is outside of, um, of my remit. Um, Referencing back to some, perhaps some of the earlier conversation this morning is that the, the size and shape of the Scottish public sector, including the structure, the government has indicated that is part of its thinking uh, around public service reform. Uh, as it relates to value for money of these bodies, um, each accountable officer has a duty of best value upon them, which each year they have to report um, that they are satisfied that the public spending allocated to them has been used properly and, and, and delivered uh, value for money or, or best value. Stepping out of that, though, I think it, it is a matter for the government to determine you know, how public services are delivered. Are they satisfied that they are delivered, uh, delivering the right outcomes and, and value for money? Um, and it's, it will, as we'll come back to the committee on over the next few weeks, it's something you know, we can pr uh, report on about the progress that they're making on, on public service reform. Okay, thank you very much indeed. We've had um, a long and detailed uh, session this morning. There are still some areas I think uh, we'd uh, ask you to clarify for us, Auditor General, and uh, it's pretty clear that there are some outstanding questions that uh, we should not direct at you but direct at the Scottish Government, so we'll have to consider how best uh, we're going to do that. But uh, uh, can I thank you very much indeed, Auditor General, uh, Helen Russell and Carol Grant, for uh, your willingness to give us such a comprehensive um, evidence session this morning. It's greatly appreciated. Uh, I'm now going to close the uh, public part of the session and move the committee into private session. Thank you.